Welcome back to another episode of Dirty Strength Radio. Today on the show, we are going to be talking about pelvic floor health for men. So if you or someone you love is a man, then you might want to tune into this episode. Check it out. I'm your host, Sarah Smith, and this is Dirty Strength Radio. This is a show about cultivating whole body resilient strength in the modern world. From fitness to farming, food production and faith, we are talking about how to desanitize our lives and fitness practices, connect to the earth, and have sharp minds, strong bodies, and great character. Hey guys, Sarah here. Super pumped to talk to you about male pelvic health issues. There's a ton of overlap because, you know, the pelvic floor is a group of muscles. Men have them. Women have them. A lot of the stuff is similar, some differences. But I wanted to make an episode that was specific to men, specifically about males. I get questions more and more online and in my email from men who find me because I'm talking about the pelvic floor on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever, and I love when they reach out to me. I love that they're trying to do something about it. I love that they're aware enough that this is a problem, that they're doing their research, and that they feel comfortable discussing it. I think it's so important that people are motivated to address these issues because if you know me and you've heard me talk about the pelvic floor before, you know that my feeling is that it's a symptom of things going awry in the body, but it's never just about the pelvic floor. And so if we ignore the pelvic floor and the screaming, fix me, fix me, that our pelvic floor is shouting at us, then we often are not addressing other issues, which can lead to chronic disease down the line, much larger problems. So when we have pelvic floor issues, we got to pay attention to them, okay? And that goes for anything in the body. Anytime you get a little red flag, I mean, I'm not saying like every ache and pain has to have an explanation, but when you have something that's just consistently nagging at you, telling you, mm, something ain't right, then you, you, we've got you, we all have got to pay attention to these things. So, so I love it. I love that men reach out to me to talk about it. And I'm trying more and more to create content to meet them where they are. My courses, guys, if you're listening here, you can take any of my courses. Connect your core and pelvic floor and hold up our, you know, I made them for women. They're geared towards females, but all of the movement strategies, a lot of the content, the lifestyle adjustments, they're going to be relevant to you too. So, and maybe you'll learn a thing or two about the women in your life and helping meet their needs. So no downside, but I am, I am hoping to put some content together that is just male specific that men, I can just be like, Hey, here you go, guys. Here you go, dudes. Like, let's do this. So. But anyways, the thing about the pelvic floor and pelvic health in general that's so funny to me is that it's so much what I talk about now and many of the health issues that come up, whether it's, you know, breathing or strength or digestive issues, hormones, you know, a lot of things that go on in the body, I come at them through the lens of pelvic health. And that was never the plan. Um, I was talking on Instagram last week about when I started my business, like I was just doing fitness. I was doing hormonal based fat loss for women, trying to help women understand that changing their physique did not mean, you know, starving and jogging themselves to death, but that there was a very strategic and smart way to change their physique using strength training, using a respect for hormones, prioritizing rest and recovery you know, a diet that is supportive of your goals, all that sort of stuff. And I really enjoyed it. I had a great group that I had. My my first coaching club was called Cultivate for Life. And it was just a great group of women. We had a lot of fun. And I was not planning on, I mean, actually at that point, I didn't even really know. I think I had heard the term pelvic floor like one other, once in my life. Um, and then when I was diagnosed with pelvic floor dysfunction and prolapse, My goal was really, how can I fix this as fast as possible without anyone knowing about it so that I can get back to being, you know, a fitness person. But as I started to see, like, the lack of information that was out there and 
I started to understand how much of my own fitness practices were actually in balance. As much as I was promoting a better mindset that I think a lot of the fitness and exercise industry promotes, there were still like huge gaping holes in that strategy and that my philosophy. And I was still really beating up on my body and not treating it in the holistic way that I do now. So interestingly enough, the more I learned about what we have to do to get to the root of our pelvic floor problems, the more that changed my relationship with exercise and the more I wanted to actually, you know, share the message, like become like a a missionary to the world and be like, hey, we're all doing it wrong. (laughs) Let's go. Let's change this. We need a paradigm shift. We need to change how we're training our bodies. We need to change how we're thinking about our bodies. We need to change a bunch of stuff or we're going to be in trouble. And, you know, the timing was interesting because really I think part of it is that I'm more outspoken about pelvic floor health, but pelvic floor health is getting a lot of traction. More and more people are having issues with it. More and more people are realizing that the issues they've been having fall under the umbrella of pelvic floor struggles. So in the end, I guess I'm thankful for it, but It's funny how keen I am to talk about it now because it was not the case. It was not the case at all. And there's a ton of shame around this topic. You know, I've said, I've talked about that here before. And, you know, anyone here that struggles with it, it's it's hard because when you have pelvic floor issues, it's really personal in some ways. Like the things that you're struggling with are, can be related to like elimination. You might be leaking urine or feces, which is not something you want to be public about, right? It's not something you're trying to advertise. You might have discomfort in sex, which you may or may not even feel comfortable telling your partner about. And, you know, there's constipation, there's actual pain and spasms. Men, specifically, since we're talking about men, men will have painful spasms in the pelvic floor and they can have erectile dysfunction they can have difficulty climaxing or climaxing climaxing like really fast and not feeling like they have control over it Um, difficulty voiding thoroughly sometimes it can be uncomfortable to urinate there can be a burning sensation you can feel like you have a bladder infection Um, you know there's There's so many things that can happen. Hemorrhoids. I mean, like, this is stuff that no one's like, hey, I really want to talk about it. And it's for me, it's funny that I talk about it so openly now. I'll be in conversation with strangers or new clients, and, you know, we'll just be talking frankly about things that are going on in the body. I I don't even think twice about it because it's just science. It's just biology. It's just like, well, you know, think of it this way. This is what your cells are doing because they're angry. So, like, let's make your cells less angry. When we make our cells less angry, we make our, you know, whether we're talking nerve cells or skeletal, the, the cells that make up your skeletal muscle or epidermis even, like, there's all different kinds of cells, mucosal lining involved in everything that's going on when it comes to the pelvic floor. And, you know, we make them less angry. We make them happier. We make them more balanced. Then they stop wigging out and acting weird and then we feel better and so we need to be able to talk about it you know and there there just needs to be I think a greater level of comfort around this topic so that people can get the help that they need and I'm working hard on it with on the female side but I'm wanting to spread that a little bit more into the male side as well so let's let's talk about it. What's the deal with male pelvic floor issues? Well, I've already kind of touched on some of the symptoms. So if you're here and you're a man and you're like, okay, some girl told me I need to listen to this show for whatever reason, and I'm listening and you're describing things that I'm dealing with, okay, let's talk about it. So let's just review one more time pelvic floor symptoms, okay? Indicators that you have a problem with your pelvic floor. Any kind of weird peeing habits, okay? You pee often, you have difficulty voiding, there's any burning sensation, you've been checked out for any kind of bacterial infection or, you know, sexually transmitted disease or anything like that, that's not it, okay? You're, um, maybe you're leaking feces, right? So, um, like, losing gas, losing control a little bit and some, a little bit of stool comes out and this can happen oftentimes in workouts, right? Hemorrhoids, which is related to that because both the leaking of stool and then also hemorrhoids can be a lack of ability to manage pressure. On the sexual side, performance, so if sex is painful, if you have difficulty getting an erection, if you have difficulty maintaining an erection, or if you climax like really quickly and too soon, it's not enjoyable, things like that. 
and let me think anything oh yeah and then just pain pelvic like spasms muscular spasms you just feel super tight maybe you just your pelvic floor feels lifted like testicles feel really lifted everything just feels super tight and then when that is the case that can often be coupled with some hip or persistent back pain these are pelvic floor these are pelvic floor problems okay so oh and constipation we can't forget that constipation it can be because you have a super tight posterior pelvic floor. If you can't relax your posterior pelvic floor, then the rectum doesn't really open, relax properly. It makes it difficult to eliminate stool easily. And then if stool is not re removed pretty much daily or every other day, it, it can become dehydrated and hardens. And in addition to the fact that hormones and toxins get reabsorbed into the bloodstream, which messes with your body and messes with elimination, it just gets really difficult to get out the stool. And you need to be pooping generally like every day or every other day to get your toxins and to get your um, expired yucky used hormones out and also just so that it doesn't get dry and make it difficult. And then you like everything starts to back up and you can have all these other problems upstream from there in your gut. Eh, no bueno, right? Not to mention like the bloating and cramping is uncomfortable. It can make working out difficult and, and just moving in general, your mood. I mean, I've actually literally felt like in a terrible mood before just because like my system is a little backed up. So you can become a little bit more emotional, a little bit um, have like a shorter fuse, like all these things. So yeah, so these are some pelvic floor issues. You got it now? You hear the symptoms or you're like, okay, that sounds like me. Yeah, I got a little bit of that. And the question is, what do we do about it? right? What do we do? So depending on how severe it is, you know, um, I worked with someone once that they literally have been like constipated for like a week. I would say that would probably be a good idea to go and see your doctor and do something you really want to, you know, avoid any kind of bowel obstruction, which could require you to have surgery and have them go in and surgically remove something. So you don't want to let things go that long. But all of the things we're talking about here, they're urgent and they're problematic in the sense that they negatively impact your quality of life, right? But they generally are not emergency room type, you know, problems. And sometimes you'll even go to your physician and they won't really ask all the right questions or they won't, they'll, they'll think that it's strict like mental health issue and just anxiety or something and they'll want to prescribe like antidepressants. It happens on the female side all the time, but it definitely happens with men as well. And that is just not going to solve your problem. Numbing your emotions and giving you a false, um, you know, supply of serotonin is not going to fix your pelvic floor issues or the pain that your pelvic floor is causing you because if that's not the root cause. There can be an emotional component, but we'll talk about that too. So, so the question is like, what do you do? You're listening and you're like, well, what, like, what's my course of action? Like, how do I fix this? So there's several areas that we tend to need to look at when the pelvic floor is a problem. The first thing I like to look at is breathing, airway health. Do you breathe with the diaphragm? This is really important because if you're not breathing with the diaphragm properly, meaning like your thoracic diaphragm is moving up and down in coordination with your pelvic floor. When you take an inhale, your thoracic diaphragm lowers, your pelvic floor lowers. When you exhale, <sighs> pelvic floor lifts, Diaphragm comes up, helps and pushes the air out of your lungs, okay? When you're breathing with the diaphragm, ideally you're getting a 360 degree expansion with your breath. So your rib cage is expanding in all directions, the front, the back, and the side. Many of us are not good at this. Many of us are either breathing too much into the chest or too much into the back. If you have like rounded shoulder postures or a lot of internal rotation in the shoulders, I see that a lot of guys um, in the gym have these issues where their, you know, their shoulders are internally rotated and they're, they're oftentimes breathing shallowly. Shallowly, is that a word? They have a shallow breathing pattern, but they're breathing into the back, which actually increases the internal rotation because they're not getting expansion in the chest. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a lot of benching and a lot of work on your pecs and things like that, and those muscles are super tight and you have the habit of not having your tongue rest on the roof of your mouth, breathing through your nose, and really focusing on getting, getting that full 360 degree breath, then you know, the compensation can be that you just breathe into your bath, back, which 
will throw off your posture and lead to you know very varying positions in your pelvis which negatively impacts your pelvic floor not to mention the fact if you're not getting a super deep breath quality breath and you're not breathing you know through your nose then you're spending less time in the parasympathetic state of the nervous system than you really need to be when we're just kind of breathing that through the mouth and where it's a shallow breath, then that actually is a stress response. And just breathing like that can make us more stressed. So it can push us more into the sympathetic. And when we're in the sympathetic state of the nervous system, we don't re relax. Our system doesn't relax. All of our muscles are a little bit more acidic, so a little bit more twitchy. So we tend to be tight. We have reduced range of motion and flexibility. And that often goes hand in hand with pelvic, pelvic floor over recruitment. So a tight, engaged pelvic floor. So people that have tight engaged pelvic floors are going to experience difficulty voiding fully. If you can't fully relax the bladder, then it can be difficult to get all of the urine out. So you might find yourself going to the bathroom often, or you might feel that burning sensation, like, or just this, the feeling like you need to pee even though there's nothing there. You can also have pelvic muscle spasms and you know the all the erectile dysfunction issues and everything difficulty eliminating because it's you can't relax you can't let stool out and then because you're pressing a lot pushing down on your pelvic floor either to push out stool or to to lift heavy things in the gym you often can end up dealing with hemorrhoids if you keep doing it for a period of time then you can get into that place where you're leaking stool too because the pressure is just too great and you start to lose the ability to hold in stool. In fact, some people even start to deal with prolapse of the rectum because they don't know how to relax the pelvic floor. So they're always pushing up against a pelvic floor that's really recruited. There's not a lot of give. And so it will become too much at one point. And you can, if you lift too heavy one day, your rectum can literally be pushed out, which is, you know, like we're not going for that, right? <laughs> so, so this is just the breathing. The breathing alone, breathing, getting that 360 degree expansion in the breath, really signaling to your diaphragm to move through its full range of motion is going to calm your nervous system. So it's gonna change how all your muscles, your whole system works, and is gonna help you to get a connection to your pelvic floor because like I said, pelvic floor and thoracic diaphragm move together. If you've never done any breath training, or maybe you have, maybe you've done breath training, but it's like just like the Wim Hof stuff, which has benefits to it, but, you know, there's a lot of sexy breath work out there. But what I want you to do is just learn good old fashioned breathing mechanics of what you did as a baby and what you should, what your body should do automatically, which is just tongue on the roof of your mouth, inhaling. You're supposed to be breathing through your nose. You really shouldn't be breathing through your mouth. If you're sprinting, okay. But as much as possible during your workouts and stuff, mouth shut, breathing in the nose, controlled breath. 360 degree expansion of the chest and calm, okay? Control your breath. Controlling your breath is, is self-control. And so if you can control your breath, you can really control anything. You control your emotions, you can control your strength, you can actually lift heavier things. And so if you've never trained breath work and really focused on moving your diaphragm through its full range of motion, you can continue listening to the rest of this episode, but I want you to take my breathing course. It's a free digital course. It's called Better Than Kegels, and it will be linked here in the show notes. You can go to Better Than Kegel or tinyurl.com, Better Than Kegels, or you can go to dirtystrength.com, and you'll see a way to sign up for my digital course there. You need to take that. You need to just sit and watch the modules. It's, it's very straightforward really good visuals. It's going to help you understand why breathing is so essential. So breathing mechanics are number one. We have to address this. And the reason we have to address breathing mechanics is because the next thing that is contributing to your pelvic floor issues is your movement mechanics. I've worked with a number of men now at this point that they're in really good shape. They lift, they're training, they've got muscles, they have big chest, they have, you know, they're, they just, they look like they're fit but their biomechanics are off. They have a pelvic tilt and it's not super noticeable all the time. 
And to people that are not really looking for it, it might not be apparent. It's sometimes when you just look at somebody and they generally look pretty fit and strong, you don't really notice that they have any kind of, you know, funny postural habits. But if you keep looking, you're like, oh, their pelvis really dumps forward. And so if you're somebody that your pelvis kind of dumps forward, you have what's called interior orientation of the pelvis. You're not, not able to keep your pelvis under your rib cage, basically your hips under your ribs, then what is happening there is, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, one of the reasons this happens in the first place is because your breathing mechanics are off. If you're not naturally breathing with your tongue in the roof of your mouth, you lose stability in the pelvis. And so then the pelvis can move in all different ways. And this can lead to back pain. This can lead to hip issues, problems. It can lead to gait pattern issues and then all different compensations. Like literally you can get knee and ankle injuries because of pelvic position, because of your breathing habits. Like it's wild how connected everything is. So, so, so yeah, so the problem is, is that, you know, we have a pelvis that isn't necessarily underneath us. And if the pelvis is not oriented so that the pelvic floor can kind of have a direct line of communication with the thoracic diaphragm. So the pelvic floor is a diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm needs to be under the thoracic diaphragm, which literally actually needs to be under your cervical diaphragm. We won't get into that in this episode because it's just too much. The cervical diaphragm, which is in your throat, and your cranial diaphragm, which is in your head, which is why stacked alignment posture is so important in everything in everyday life but definitely when you're adding load to your body if you don't have that then you're going to have difficulty engaging your pelvic floor you're going to have a hard time recruiting it when you need to and relaxing it the recruitment part of the pelvic floor is important because when it lifts and engages it it gives stability to the pelvis and the pelvis is at the base of your torso so your core strength and your core stability in a large part comes from your pelvic floor. It's actually how your pelvic floor works together with your deep core muscles, like your transverses abdominis, your internal obliques, and the air, the pressure that you create when you inhale. All of these things work together to give you stability in the trunk. And it doesn't work if you don't have kind of, a, if you have good alignment. The way I like to describe it is, is that you need the signal from the thoracic diaphragm to the pelvic floor to be strong, right? So you need a direct line of communication. If you ever use those tin cans when you were a kid, when you like tie a string, this, this is probably an analogy that's going to be outdated very shortly because I don't know if kids do this anymore, but you know, you got a can and you poke a hole in it and you put a string in one and the other and you know, you run across the yard or as long as you can get a string, you know, the sound, when you speak into the can, the sound will be echoed by the can and then it will travel down the string into the other can, which is it's cool. It's like your own little makeshift telephone, except that you, you know, I mean, it's attached by a string instead of a wire, although telephones don't even have wires anymore, but you know, I'm dating myself. So think of it that way. If you have the can that is your thoracic diaphragm and the can that is your pelvic floor and they need to talk to each other and they need to have really good communication, the line of communication is gonna be so much better when they're, it's a straight one right? When they're stacked over each other. So we have to train that. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're jogging, jumping, running, pressing overhead, deadlifting, you know, you need to make sure that you have this alignment that is somewhat stacked. Now you can pivot, you can tilt the body. You know, when we hinge in the deadlift, we're hinging forward, but we still do it in a manner that our ribs are over our pelvis so that we still have a direct line of communication from the diaphragm to the pelvis. And you know, there's, it's not, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not like if you're not in this exact line, you're gonna have pelvic floor problems. But many people don't realize that they're living with their pelvis out in front of them, dipping forward, and it impacts how you walk, how you lift, how you breathe. And then the body has to work overtime. And so then your spinal stabilizers are kicking in a lot more. So you're more likely to have pain in your back. I see a lot of people dealing with QL issues, psoas problems, um, piriformis pain, because the body is always struggling to create stability because the pelvis is not underneath the rib cage and the stability isn't being created by the breath. When you inhale, when you take an inhale, right, you're like, oh, that wasn't a good inhale. Sorry. When I'm doing a lot of public speaking or recording, it's difficult to get a good breath. Okay, here we go. Let me try it again. Okay, that 
was a loud inhale, but you got it, right? So when you inhale, you fill your core canister with pressure. And then when you exhale, and if you do a sighing exhale, especially like, you get this like corset feeling where you're almost like being hugged internally from inside. The inhale, which is the increase in pressure, the pressure is like bumping up against your body. You know, you have like your abdominal wall, you have skeletal um, muscle, you have your your obliques, you have your rectus, you have your body is pushing back, right? Because the canister that is your body can only expand so much. So when you fill the it internally with an increase in pressure because you take in a deep breath and the air doesn't go everywhere, like the air goes into your lungs, but the increase in pressure comes from you fill your lungs with air, ideally in all 360 degree right direction. Your thoracic diaphragm moves down. That downward movement increases the space in your lungs so you can fill even more with air, right? So thoracic diaphragm moves down. If you put your hands right now at the base of, or, you know, right underneath, if we're talking about men, pecs, I would say if you're a woman, you can put your hands at your, the bottom of your sports bra. But, and you push, you just take an inhale, or imagine taking an inhale, and you push your hands down and think about your diaphragm coming down. It's creating pressure on the contents in your abdomen. If you've ever looked inside your abdomen, and if you take Better Than Kegels, my digital breathing course, you'll see, it's chock full of stuff. Your liver is in there, your spleen, your intestines, your stomach, you get fluid, you get your nervous system, your spinal column, like you get, you get stuff in there. There's no room. So when the diaphragm moves down, it pushes on all that stuff. And it's not compressible. So it incre- there's an increase in pressure. And that increase in pressure makes you stable in movement. But if you're not doing that, if you're not getting that good inhale and that diaphragm isn't coming down and creating that pressure that literally hugs your spine and, and pushes up against, like I said, your abdominal wall, fills your pelvic cavity with pressure too, right? If you don't have that, then you're just going to be all loosey-goosey. And so your body's going to look for it elsewhere. So people that don't really do a good job of breathing with their diaphragm, again, it's going to be an airway piece where you can't get your tongue on the roof of your mouth, um, or it's just a habit that you have not. It can be that your pelvis isn't underneath you, and so you're having difficulty having the thoracic diaphragm talk to the pelvic diaphragm. But if that's you, then... You know, what happens is all of the parts of your body that are supposed to provide stability are not allowed to do their job because you're not you're not setting them up for success. And so then the mobile parts, the mobilizers, the movers have to kick in and they have to offer stability. So people that have these issues oftentimes just have nagging aches and pains or injury because, you know, muscles that are meant to be doing the moving keep having to do the stabilizing. And that can be a problem, obviously, because then you're chronically hurt. The more injured you are, the more of a state of stress you're in. And so the more that's driving the sympathetic state of the nervous system. And when we're in the sympathetic state of the nervous system, things don't relax. Things are tight. Things are twitchy. Things are tense, bracing against like, what's going to happen? You know, I need to protect myself from danger. And then you're going to have a pelvic floor that doesn't relax. If a pelvic floor doesn't relax, then it can't do its job. If you're here and you lift, you understand that if your bicep is already recruited, biceps is already recruited, you can't lift anymore with it. You need to relax it, right? You need to open that arm up, extending it like away from the body, put a barbell or no, sorry, a dumbbell into your hand. I wouldn't, I mean, I guess probably there are people here that can curl a barbell, like more power to you, but put a dumbbell in that hand and then you can recruit. Then you have access to all the power in your biceps, right? It's the same thing in your pelvic floor. If your pelvic floor is already lifted and recruited, it can't help you. It can't lift and recruit and give stability to the pelvis in movement when you're running or you're jumping or you're lifting or doing a burpee or double unders or whatever it is that you want to do playing soccer, it's already working. So if you want your pelvic floor to relax or you want your pelvic floor to do its job, you need to teach it to relax. And teaching it to relax comes from the breath. And the breathing in the right posture with good alignment is going to calm your nervous system. It's going to calm and relax the muscles. It's going to be more efficient. 
and your the whole body is going to be happier because everyone's going to be doing their job. The stabilizers are going to be stabilizing. The movers are going to be free to move. Your breath is going to be, you know, creating pressure so that you can be stable in movement. It's going to be relaxing you. It's going to keep you from being in a super stressed state of the nervous system. You know, you're just going to be much happier. So breathing mechanics, movement mechanics. There's movement mechanics is more to that in that in so far as like, you know, what's going on with your feet. If there's some issues with your feet, either you supinate too much or pronate too much or, you know, on one side versus the other, that's going to impact your gait. Impact, your gait is going to, you know, impact the position of your pelvis and how your pelvis operates. And so you can have a little asymmetry on either side of the pelvis. Everybody does. We're all asymmetrical. Um anyways and that's okay we, we're never going to be perfectly symmetrical the body isn't perfectly symmetrical you have different things on different side right the diaphragm is actually shaped differently on either side because you have your liver in the way that's a whole other discussion but you're not going to be perfectly symmetrical but because you're not perfectly symmetrical you know there can be a little bit of imbalance and then if you add a ton of volume to that and the body starts compensating in some ways but maybe holding some tightness on one side of the pelvic floor versus the other, then you're gonna to have to address that too. So I will I will see people oftentimes, you know, and if you're if you're a guy and you lift or you train a lot, if you do any hypertrophy training, you probably notice that like you can build one glute easier than the other or one quad easier than the other. And this comes down to like your ability to access those muscles. And your ability to access those muscles is in large part determined like how how well you can work them right can you work them enough can you access them enough to work them and if you can't it's usually because your nervous system can't really find the muscles to the extent that it needs to i mean this is like a crude explanation here because there's some asymmetry going on at the pelvis and i wish you could see me right now because i'm like talking with my hands but if you think about your pelvis it's like kind of looks like a butterfly with those the two bones the ilium they are not fused they can move differently on either side and so if you have a little bit of asymmetry in the pelvis going on and you have a little bit more tightness over recruitment on one side of the pelvic floor because you're compensating in some way um, because of this imbalance and that's going to impact your pelvic floor as well so we have to look at mechanics and so if you've known for a long time that you have some kind of imbalance or you're like oh i always have pain on the right side of my back or yeah i blew out my knee and had to have surgery you know in addition to wanting to get our pelvis underneath us we also have to look and see like are both sides of the pelvis operating because the pelvic floor is a supple responsive trampoline that is attached to your pelvic bones right and it's going to respond to the position of the bones. And if the bones are shifting in a way that is not optimal, then you might have one side of your trampoline like that's lifted. If you think, if you've ever seen a trampoline like in the yard, and if you imagine like if one side was like kind of bent up or it was on uneven ground or the frame of it was bent a little bit, then you know, when you bounced on that part, it would respond differently than if you bounced on the other part that was maybe a little bit more even and flat. Or because one side is bent, the other side is also bent to compensate for it. And then you're, you're in a, you know, you're in a pickle. So these are the things that we need to think about and we need to relate. It's just like, you know, you might just think, oh, I don't know, this whole thing has come out of the blue. All of a sudden I'm having crazy muscle spasms in my pelvic floor and it's negatively impacting, you know, peeing and pooping and sex and, and, and performance in the gym and whatever. Yeah, it's likely that there was some asymmetry going on um, already in part, probably responding to how you move, your gait pattern, um, pelvic position, maybe your breath, maybe what's going on in your thorax too. What's happening in the pelvis will res is responding often to what's happening around your rib cage. If you have any, like, like I was saying in the beginning, if you're really expanded out the back and compressed in the front, you have a lot of internal rotation in the shoulders, you're not really getting a good breath. The, the pelvis responds to that. The whole body, everything is connected. In the body's mind, which is our mind, there is no, oh, um, I'm not the pelvic floor, so that doesn't concern me. Everything is connected, right? We, we name things so we can talk about them. So when I have a conversation and I wanna talk about this part of the body, 
um, in these bony structures, I'm going to say ribs, so you know what I'm talking about. But it's not like the body's like, oh, that's just my rib. That has nothing to do with me. You know, it's like it's one big system. Everybody's talking all the time. Everything is fluid. And so you got to think about your your past injuries, some of your mechanical issues, some of your chronic injuries, maybe how you favor one side or whatever, and know that that is impacting what's going on with your pelvic floor. I, I love when I talk to my females, I always talk about how like, the pelvic floor is the hammock at the base of your body that catches all the unresolved issues. Everything in your brain, everything in your heart, everything in your movement, everything in your nervous system, your lymphatic system, your digestive system, everything. Everything you don't resolve is caught by that. Because you have these like transverse diaphragms, like I mentioned, in your cranium, your cervical diaphragm in your throat, your thoracic diaphragm in your chest, and your pelvic floor, and they run transverse. A lot of things in the body run, you know, north to south, right, up and down. But these guys run the opposite of that. They're perpendicular. And I, th- I find that we can get stuck. If we're dealing with a ton of grief for some reason, then that will often get stuck in the thoracic diaphragm, stuck in the lungs, stuck in the thoracic diaphragm. And if we're having a lot of stress in the body, that will that can oftentimes start in the head and get stuck there in the, the cranial diaphragm. But basically things just kind of filter down. And so when you don't resolve issues, eventually your chickens come home to roost and a lot of times it will manifest in the pelvic floor. That's why almost anyone that I've ever worked with, they never just have an issue in the pelvic floor. There's always something else. There's always like an emotional piece, um, a digestive health, something going on with the liver, some long-term trauma, like something else. And then the pelvic floor is just like, I caught it. (laughs) I'm holding on to it because you're not addressing it. So everything falls down here and this hammock catches it. So it's something to think about on the mechanic side. So breathing mechanics and moving mechanics are huge. Um, Two other areas that I'm going to quickly address. One is diet. So The dietary piece is really important for everybody to understand. If you're not consuming food that contains good building blocks for tissue, you're not going to be able to build tissue. So imagine I'm like, hey, I want you to build me this amazing Lego castle. And I give you all the directions and I tell you everything that you need to do. The instructions are there. I'm like, it's going to be awesome. Build it. And then you're like, okay, great. Give me the supplies. And then I give you these jacked up like imitation crappy Legos that are like, they they technically look like Legos, but they're made by some like bootleg company and they don't really fit together and they're not right. They're not the right shape. They're just off enough, you know, where they don't connect. You're not going to be able to make a really banging Lego castle, right? And it's the same thing with the building blocks of your tissue. If you're not, it's like garbage in, garbage out or garbage in, garbage staying in rather because... If you're putting things into your body, like a lot of men think, especially if they're trying to put on muscle, it doesn't matter what they eat. They're like, oh, I'm having protein shake. As long as I'm getting the right macro ratio, that's all that matters. But I'm telling you that that's not. And you know, as you get older, it will become more and more apparent. But I'm telling you the age of the people that are coming to work with me with pelvic floor issues is getting younger and younger. I recently had a very fit guy who was in his 20s come to me that's having pelvic floor issues and it's you know there's a number of reasons for this but one of the things that I think is is contributing to this is that we are growing up on such toxic diets now even things in the store that are labeled as natural and if you're in fitness a lot of people in fitness think oh well I eat healthy because they eat a bunch of smoothies or shake protein shakes or bars and things like that but when you actually read the ingredients and you see that they're they're oftentimes filled with GMO plant products, toxic plant products, um, rancid vegetable oils, things covered in pesticides and herbicides, then you start to understand, oh, okay, well, this might be why I have chronic digestive issues. There is an undeniable link between what's going on in the gut, what's going on in the liver, and what's going on in the pelvic floor. So a lot of guys that are in fitness they have um, hormone issues, so like a lot of breakouts, maybe some mood issues, things like that. And this speaks to the liver. That means the liver is overloaded with toxins. So you need to detox the liver. Why is the liver overloaded with toxins? Well, 
it could partly be stress it could partly be because you don't poop regularly it's often because of what you're eating so if you have pelvic floor issues really i don't like to be super dogmatic when it comes to food but i would say only eat organic and stop eating so much processed food and see what happens if you have pelvic floor issues and you also have digestive issues then you know that part of this is your gut is angry. When your gut is angry, it creates inflammation in the body. It's also difficult for you to assimilate nutrients and make good quality tissue in your muscles. If you're eating a lot of food that is processed food, um, particularly food that is probably sprayed with glyphosate, if it's any, if it's a GMO grain, and you can go and look up the glyphosate foods, um, Environmental Working Group has some information on it. Uh, Weston A. Price, I'm sure it does, Mercola, Dr. Mercola's website. You can go and check things out. You really want to steer clear of glyphosate as much as possible. Glyphosate is an herbicide. It's Roundup. It's on pretty much any GMO grain and lots of foods. If it's not organic, there's a really good chance it could have glyphosate on it. So glyphosate is a herbicide that messes with your collagen. So the structure of your collagen will actually be altered by consuming a diet that has glyphosate. If you get a little bit here and there, it's probably fine. I believe in the body's ability to detoxify and be smart and you know compensate and fight off environmental toxins. But if you're just loading yourself up with processed foods and crap, and I'm telling you, protein shakes and protein bars are two of the biggest offenders for garbage. And so, you're going to want to think about that. Take a second look at that. If you want to go deeper with the whole glyphosate thing, you can listen to my podcast interview I did with Dr. Stephanie Seneff from MIT. She's genius. She talks all about it. She explains it. And she talks about the people that she's worked with who literally have had that burning sensation, that need to go to the bathroom all the time, resolve just by eating an organic diet. I know it's expensive, but how much is the cost of having a pelvic floor that is not happy? You know, you got to think about that. The other piece that I think is really important as well is, you know, if you're eating a diet that's just not agreeing with you, it's not good for you. You know, you have increasing food intolerances. You're maybe you're having diarrhea, inflammation, and this can look different for different people. I've worked with people before that just cutting out gluten reduces inflammation in their body, and then their pelvic floor issues go away because it was a manifestation of inflammation. Some people just don't tolerate it. Some people cannot tolerate oxalates. Oxalates are a plant chemical in beets, almonds, spinach, um, sweet potatoes, you know, nut butters, what else? Tea, celery juice. These plant chemicals, I did an episode, a Dirty Strength Radio episode with Sally K. Norton. I would encourage you to listen to that too if you you eat a lot of those foods. These plant chemicals actually go and lodge themselves in tissue throughout the body but pelvic tissue is one of the key areas so you can have pain really really extremely bad pain you can have burning in the bladder um, discomfort in your pelvis in a number of different ways because you consume too many oxalates so this is something that you would want to think about as well what goes in the body ends up in your tissue So, or impacting how well you make tissue, either one. So these are the things you need to think about. If you have digestive issues, don't ignore them. I'm a big fan of carnivore-ish diet for most people. If you get um, meat that is sourced from good places, right? Because, you know, the animals eat animal feed. The animal feed is sprayed with herbicides too. So you got to eat organic. If you have like local beef, that's ideal where you know the farmer, you know what they're feeding them, you trust them, something to think about. So that's a digestive side of things. And then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about mindset. So the things I come across the most, I mean, what I'm addressing here, are the things that I come across most when I talk with men, usually they struggle with airway health, so breathing, they need to work on their breath, they have some biomechanical issue, there's a digestive component. The digestive component is often related to stress, which we're going to talk about now under mindset. Um, if you're not breathing well and you don't have really good biomechanics to facilitate breathing well, then you're not going to be in the parasympathetic state of the nervous system. You're going to be spending more time in the sympathetic. 
In the sympathetic state, that's fight or flight, or it's moving towards fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. If you can't rest and digest, then your gut's going to be a mess. If you can't rest and digest, your gut's going to be a mess. I need to put that on like a t-shirt, right? So keep that in mind. All of The thing I love about this topic, which is just so freaking fascinating, is everything's related. So everything you do to improve any of these areas is going to improve the other areas. And if you work at all of them in a slow and manageable way, they have a synergistic effect on each other. You start getting in better alignment to practice your breathing and you start breathing regularly, you're going to rest better and you're going to digest better and then your gut health is going to improve as well. So you'll still have to take out any foods that are irritating to your gut currently. Like I don't think resting and digesting is going to keep you from having a negative response if you eat a bunch of beets or if you drink a lot of spinach, you know, spinach juice spinach smoothies I don't know you know what I'm saying I can't stand spinach so that's not a problem for me <laughs> but but anyways you get it um so let's talk about mindset the last piece I do see men thinking that they can just train well, I mean, women do the same thing train 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 beat up on their bodies and not honoring rest and don't realize that exercise is stress and inflammation for the body exercise is beneficial and gets you in better shape because the adaptations that your body goes through to heal and recover from a workout makes you, helps you grow better muscles and helps you to be fitter for the next time you challenge it. You're going to grow stronger. That only works if you're getting adequate rest and recovery. So you need to have adequate food, good food. Again, eating food loaded in toxins actually is counterproductive because rather than just recovering and building muscle, your poor body is has to do all this other extra crap to get rid of all the extra crap, all the toxins. So that's when your liver starts becoming overloaded, your sleep gets interrupted, your mood stinks, and your skin starts breaking out. So that's no bueno. And, you know, you can start having gut health issues and gallbladder issues from that too, so you got to keep an eye on that. But if you're going to train hard, you're going to add inflammation and stress to the body, you need to get yourself as much as possible into a calm state before you do that. And I teach my clients how to do that before their workouts and how to do that during their workouts and also in between, you know, on non-training days. I understand people, some people here that will listen to this episode, you have like probably a strict training um, regimen that you want to follow. I talked to a guy recently and he's like, I train four days a week and I lift and I don't want to change that. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I mean, do what you got to do. But the important thing is you have to get yourself into a calm state and get into the parasympathetic before you train. If you're at like a meet or a competition and you want to go into a competition a little amped, that's different. But you can't train amped all the time. Like that's crazy. This is why you have pelvic floor issues. If you're amped, think about it. When you're amped and you're like, yeah, everything's tight and tense and lifted, including your pelvic floor, that doesn't feel good. Tight and tense and lifted does not feel good. Even if you're just thinking in terms of testicles, you're like, okay, when things, when, you know, when we get frightened, our pelvic floor tightens and lifts. We get stress, right? And in the male body, that happens and it literally like pulls the testicles up close to the body. Well, that's not how you want to live. It's definitely not going to be good for fertility purposes. It's not good for blood flow. It's not good for adequate lymph um, drainage. It's not good for to have like healthy erections. It's not good for, um, you know, you to be relaxed in order to have normal elimination. You got to calm down. So you have to learn to train in the parasympathetic. You need, you need to learn to honor that. You need to calm down. You need to have a breath practice. You need to start your workout with a breath practice. And you need to have to, you need to learn how to bring these calming practices into your workout in the beginning, if not indefinitely, in between rounds of your workout, and then also as part of your recovery. You can't just push, push, push. If you think about your, your body as like a rubber band, and if you take two ends of a rubber band and you keep turning it, and then they get really tight and they coil on each other, and you think about your body as like that, it's like all tight and coiled up, and like, ugh, like kind of like a jack-in-a-box, ready to just spring at any moment. What you need to do before your workouts and in your training is release it all. Just keep unraveling until you're, you're cool. 
And then you can go in the tra- in, in the weight room or your workouts, whatever you're doing, and train and get a little bit tighter and then relax, r- release. A little bit tighter and then release. The goal is for you when you finish your workout or you finish a week of training for you to not be a coiled up, crazy tight rubber band because that is going to manifest in a pelvic floor that doesn't relax. A pelvic floor that doesn't relax can't do its job. A pelvic floor that doesn't relax is, you know, difficulty urinating, difficulty pooping, sex that's not fun, um, you know. And I didn't mention this earlier, but I wanted to say Another important part of the biomechanics thing is that if your pelvic floor, if your pelvis is not positioned well, then your pelvic floor is going to be difficult for you to access. It's not going to be, like I said before, directly under the thoracic diaphragm. So you're not going to be able to direct it the way that you you need to. And most of what the pelvic floor does is automated. So if you want your pelvic floor to just automatically do its job, you have to put it in the right environment, right? So directly under the diaphragm. And this is important because you know, if we're thinking just strictly in terms of sex, a pelvic floor needs to relax. If it's too tight and it's too tense, like you can't have sex, but also if it's too relaxed and you can't access it, then it won't, you know, you can't do what you need to do when you want to do it either. And that can lead to the erectile dysfunction where you literally just can't get an erection. So understanding that, you know, getting the pelvis in the right position and breathing in that position, having good quality tissue, so that you can relax your pelvic floor and recruit it so it moves through its full, full range of motion. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help everything. So that I just want to reiterate that point I was thinking. I don't know if I had really emphasized that enough. There's so much to talk about. We're just scratching the surface. So yeah, so the stress piece. And one of the things I want to mention on the stress piece, and I always say this to men when they reach out to me, um, is that you know, for some people, pelvic floor pain and dysfunction and sexual dysfunction in their relationships is the wake up call that they need to, to understand that pornography is really problematic. So if you have any pelvic floor, well, let's just start here. Pornography is implicitly evil. Pornography, if you don't know, is human trafficking. You don't know when you see something. In addition to the fact that really like looking at women or men, whatever, pornography you're, I don't know I don't know what you're looking at but looking at people as sexual objects and seeing things seeing people in positions and you know engaging in certain behaviors that is not um, respectful and dignified is just wrong it's wrong it's voyeuristic it's weird if you don't know it it's weird and inappropriate to watch people you don't know have sex it's weird I don't know why in our culture in our society, in our world, we've trained people that if it's on a screen, that it's okay. Because if you just like went up to your neighbors and like looked in their window, even if they're like, yeah, come on, come look, that would be weird. It wouldn't be appropriate, right? And it's the same thing. It's voyeuristic. So it's it's implicitly like, it's not dignified. It's not, it's not an activity that fosters respect for other human beings. It objectifies people. And it's... It, for the the first time anyone ever sees anything like this, often their knee-jerk reaction is, ew, like it's unpleasant, right? But then we kind of push through barriers to keep doing things that we know we really shouldn't do. So there's that. But more than that, more than, you know, um, and, you know, and everyone here knows, like, I'm, I'm a believer. And biblically, like, even looking at and lusting at somebody or lusting for somebody is a sin as far as God is concerned. So if you're like willfully going and continually lusting after somebody that is not your spouse, then that's wrong. It's adultery. It's um, sexual depravity and it's sinful. And and because it's sinful, it leads to other harmful effects, not the least of which is pelvic floor issues, which I'm going to get to in a second. But that's a really important thing to understand. And I do think this is in part why so many men are dealing with pelvic floor issues. And I say this not to be like, oh, a goody goody two shoes and, and condemn you and make you feel bad, but I do want it to be a convicting thing because I do see that there are physical manifestations sometimes to sinful behavior, physical consequences. And what a lot of people don't know is that pornography is trafficking. You can't tell when you watch something. I don't care if they bill it as ethical porn. I don't care how willing people think they appear. I know a lot about human trafficking. I've been studying it for 10 years. And 
pornography is trafficking. Many of these people are forced. They're, it may not look like it, but they're being raped. They're forced against their will. They are often killed or die in the industry. They are forced to traffic drugs. They're forced to take drugs and to do things that they don't want to do. And some, even the videos that appear where people are happy to engage or consenting, you don't actually know. And there are plenty of instances where people have, men and women, have reported that their rape was put on major porn sites and sold over and over and over again, and they, they are unable to get them taken down. So you're, if you're watching pornography, you're often witnessing crime and engaging in crime, and that actually creates stress in the body. Because we're all made with a conscience and we're all made in God's image, we're not supposed to look at things like that. We have an innate response. It doesn't matter if our, the pleasure centers of our brain have been trained to enjoy looking at these things. The physiological response that the body has is one that is stressed. It's not happy about it. The interesting thing, though, is that if you continue to watch pornography, it changes your stress response. And your ability to self-soothe and just to be happy and to be under stress diminishes without pornography. So we find people that are actually addicted to porn. They need to watch porn to calm down. And so when that's the case, you know, um, and I'll link to organizations in the show notes if it's something that you need help with, you need to learn how to wean yourself off of it. I don't even know, which is horrifying to even have to think about. I mean, I guess I, I do believe the Lord can deliver anybody from anything immediately. So you can pray and ask the Lord to deliver you from the addiction. And I would certainly pray for you too. And I, I will pray for anybody listening to this episode that that's the case. But but oftentimes, um, you know, biochemically, you have to wean yourself off of it because you have to rewire your body's stress response and the vagus nerve which is responsible for helping us to get in and out of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic is a very important thing to be able to do we need to be able to get into the sympathetic we need to be able to get stress because that's what we use to be protected that's what we use to run races that's what we use to run away from danger that's what we use to get up and make a speech in front of you know a crowd but when we rewire the stress response then we actually need to. I mean, it's just like any other addiction. Your body gets to a point where you need the pornography to calm down. You need the porn. And the other thing that's interesting about porn too is that, you know, one in eight of the videos on any major porn sites, according to the research, is aggressive. It's very aggressive. And so there's there's an aggressive tendency um, behavior-wise in men to develop from watching pornography and porn is designed to lure you in and to get you deeper. So oftentimes it will be mild at first and then that won't be enough anymore because again, it's rewiring your pleasure centers and your stress response in your mind. So, you know, because it's innately evil and because we're not supposed to look at it, the depravity just pulls you deeper and deeper. And so you'll, ha- you'll find yourself having to look at more severe, more aggressive, horrific things. And, and so what happens then is that if you're a nice guy that just has an addiction to porn because you were exposed to it at a young age and you thought it was normal and now your brain tells you that you need it and your stress response tells you that you need it, then you start to maybe have more aggressive tendencies and then the problem is the aggression because you're nice, you know it's wrong, you have to work so hard to repress it and repressing that manifests a stress in the body. So there's lots of research to show that neurologically is a a very negative response to watching porn in the body. And we know that the pelvic floor and proper sexual function is related to the nervous system, you know, and pleasure centers in the body. So if you're having pelvic floor issues and pornography is something in your life, this is something you're going to have to address too. And take it as a blessing. Take it as like, you know, God is really using this serious red flag to get me to to get out of this fantasy world that isn't real, that is encouraging some unhealthy behaviors, unhealthy biology. Literally, my cells are changing because of it and get me back to the real world where I have meaningful, loving, caring interactions, you know, with a, a 
hopefully a spouse that loves me and respects me and my body will respond positively to that. And it might take a little bit of work. I think, you know, it's very realistic to, to see counseling, to get some support. A lot of times there's support groups. Like I said, if there's a weaning process, I don't, I wouldn't even know what that looked like. I just know from my own research that that can often be part of it. And I definitely think there's a spiritual component where we just have to confess our sins to the Lord and say, God, help me with this. Deliver me from this addiction. Help me to stop going back there. Change my brain, change my nervous system so that I don't need it. And release my pelvic floor, which has become imprisoned and captured by this horrible stress that I've put. You know, it's it's beautiful that we have such a strong conscience that even on a cellular level, our body w- when things come in our eyes, our body will see that's not right and it will manifest. And, you know, erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction is a huge problem amongst people that are addicted to porn. And so you can do all the breathing and you can do all the dietary stuff. You can get your pelvic floor operational. You can rest better between workouts, stop overdoing it and everything. But this is an area that will have to be addressed as well. And, um, I pray that that for anybody here, and I know not everyone's listening will struggle with it, but some people will. And I think this is an important thing for people to know about. I really hate that in the church, there's just, there's just a lot of shame oftentimes. Like I think there's, there's a balance. Like we can say this behavior is wrong. It's harmful. Look what it's doing to you. Look at what it's doing to other people. Like we can call it what it is, but we have to all recognize that all have, sin and falling short of the glory of God. And we all struggle with different things at different times. And pornography is one of those things. And so people, when they need help, they need to feel comfortable saying, I need help with this and going to legitimate sources that can help them. So I'll link to a couple of those in the show notes if um, if that's you, because I want you to have resources and I want you to find healing. You know, at the end of the day, like we were created in the image of God and our bodies are beautiful, amazing things. And we're meant to move and experience life and to not be afraid that our bodies are going to misbehave. We don't want to be embarrassed about sexual dysfunction or, you know, leaking. And we certainly don't want to be dealing with sharp, horrible pains in our pelvis, right? Like these are these are serious detractors from life. And so I am thankful that I've experienced my own pelvic floor issues so that I've had to become knowledgeable about it and that the, you know, I really feel like God has encouraged me to zoom out as much as possible because a lot of people talk about the pelvic floor, but they're very, very much focused on the pelvic floor itself and just the muscles. And that's really important. I'm glad we have that. But for many people, I see that zooming out and seeing how the pelvic floor is actually connected to a lot of daily habits and, um, you know, aspects of their lifestyle is, is more helpful because you can do all the exercises in the world. You can kegel, you can try and downtrain your pelvic floor by releasing tension. But if you don't understand why your pelvic floor is getting tight and tense in the first place, and if it's happening because of something else going on in your life and your body, you're never going to get better. So these are the things, um, these are the areas that are the biggest rocks. And in all of them, we can go much deeper. So like I said, I'm working on some course content stuff. We'll see um, where that takes me. Hopefully I'll have a course for male pelvic floor issues too, if there's a demand for it. So if you like this episode, please share it with the men in your life and give me feedback too, because I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear what follow-up questions you have. I feel very strongly about this topic. And I think one of the reasons I have such a heart for it is, you know, I'm a mom of three boys. I'm raising boys and I, I'm, I have a husband who I absolutely adore and respect and I think is a wonderful man. And I have friends that have husbands that are the same. I don't believe in this toxic masculinity message that is being perpetuated in our culture. I think men being ashamed of their masculine tendencies is terrible. I think it's horrible and I think it's exactly what the powers that be want because when men don't stand up and and show up in the world in all the fullness of their strength and masculinity, women have to step in to do that job and women get bitter and resentful and we, we're we strong and we're capable and we can defend ourselves, but there's a role. God has given men the role, especially men within households, to be the protector and to be the provider. And when they don't do that, it leaves us vulnerable in so many ways. 
we know that you know the crime rates in this country are directly related to single parent homes where the father is absent we know that men can be um perpetuator perpetrators sorry of crime violent crimes but they also stop them so we need strong men and if pelvic floor issues are holding you back from making you feel strong then i want to help solve that because i want courageous men and like i said even if you're dealing with an addiction that is impacting that i know that god is bigger than that i know you can beat that and i know that if you have the will to um improve yourself and to overcome these issues then you will do it and that god will god will help you so i just want men to be as equipped as possible with whatever it is that they need to show up in the fullness of their masculinity for our culture for our society and for our world because good strong amazing women need good strong amazing men and pelvic floor issues shouldn't be holding men or women back and it's it's such an intimate topic that's shrouded in shame for so many people that i i really want to cut through all that give the hard truths give people practical brass tacks strategies for like how to move forward so we can all just be living in the fullness that God has designed for us to live through. So or live in. So yeah, um, some of this stuff will be individualized. So your exact movement mechanics, what you're dealing with, you know, you might need some help. You might need some individualized attention. So if you want to reach out to me and get on a coaching call and do a movement evaluation, talk about what's going on with your body. We can talk about movement. We can talk about breathing. We can talk about airway health. We can talk about digestion. We don't have to talk about porn, don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we can get to the bottom of it. And I, I, just as a caveat, I really want everyone here to understand that I do not think that just because people have pelvic floor issues that they're watching porn. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. So I don't want people to be like, oh, well, if I reach out to her, she's going to think, um, you know, she's going to call me a voyeur. I'm not. I just, I see that that is a contributing factor largely because of the stress it creates in the body so if you're gonna address stress address that stress too okay and that's it we'll leave it at that thank you so much for tuning in to dirty strength radio i love you guys i love my community here i appreciate you sharing my content with others can you please if you enjoy this show like rate and review on apple Podcasts? it helps me reach more people I select a reviewer of the week and the reviewers of the week get added into a drawing to be a reviewer of the month. A reviewer of the month will receive 50% off a Sarah Smith Strength product. So it's a win-win for you. If you like the show, please rate, review on Apple Podcasts, give me five stars, write an actual review. That way I can find you, find your name, whatever your Apple podcast handle is. And I will announce it on social media and social media, social media, and in my email newsletter. Thank you so much for being here. I really love you guys. Have a great day.